everybody. Um, today is Thursday, February 9th, and uh, Committee on Higher Education will be called to order. Uh, today we got two bills coming up. Um, first will be my bill around the Addiction Medicine Graduate Fellowship, and the second bill, uh, which has to do, uh, which is uh, uh, in regards to foster students, that's uh, carried by Senator Rarick, who will also be here. Um, so for now, I'll be passing the gavel to Vice Chair Eric Punnam. But before I do that, we have uh, a guest here today who will be filling in for Chris Meyer. Um, Taylor Jones will be the CLA for today. So thank you, Taylor, for joining us. Thank you. First order of business today is Senate File 1269. Uh, Chair Fate, if you'd like to uh, commence your presentation of the bill. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, uh, I'm glad to present and author Senate File 1269, uh, which would fund the only addiction medicine fellowship program we have in Minnesota. Uh, since being elected to the legislature, I've been very engaged in the issues of addiction and how they are impacting my community and our state as a whole. Uh, access to treatment facilities is limited, and in fact, only about 10% of people with a substance use disorder receive the treatment they need. Some of, some of the lack of treatment services is structural. Uh, some of it is due to a lack of a, of a well-trained workforce, and some is related to the historic, historical stigma around substance use disorder. It was in 2008 that Congress passed the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, and a federal report released in January of this year found insurers and health plans are failing to provide mental health and substance use treatment coverage at the same level as medical and surgery benefits. And it's a major barrier to care, especially for, for those who are already struggling to get help. We don't have enough clinical providers trained in the specialty of addiction. Graduating physicians out of med school have between six and eight hours of training about a disease that impacts tens of millions of Americans and their families. Over the past several decades, there has been an expanding awareness uh, of the importance of substance abuse addiction, uh, education uh, for medical students, residents, and practicing physicians. We are lucky to have one of the first addiction medicine fellowships in the country housed between HCMC and the University of Minnesota with rotations at those facilities and the Minneapolis Veterans Hospital. Uh, Senate File 1269 would provide funding to train up to three physicians per year in the specialty of, of uh, addiction medicine. And with us today, we have uh, Dr. Charlie Reznikoff uh, and Dr. Sh uh, Sheila Specker, uh, Specker uh, who ran the fellowship for many years. So I'll pass it to them, Mr. Chair. Dr. Reznikoff, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Charles Reznikoff. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, th uh, members of the committee, thank you for considering Senate File 1269, which would provide essential funding for the only addiction medicine fellowship in Minnesota. So my name is Charlie Reznikoff. I'm an internal medicine doctor and addiction doctor at Hennepin Healthcare, HCMC, and in Rice County. Uh, and I'm a graduate of the fellowship program myself. Dr. Specker taught me in 2006. Uh, so, you know, just this morning I cared for a young man who was on synthetic club drugs and he ended up in the ICU after an overdose. His parents brought me a file of photographs and documents showing how worried they were for his life. And I had to sort of manage this very complex situation. And then later in the morning, I saw a young woman who was addicted to opioids and pregnant for the first time, her first pregnancy. And she enrolled in our clinic and she is hopeful for her future and for, and for her family, future family. And I am, I am hopeful for her as well. Um, so we hear a lot about the death toll of addiction in Minnesota, but what we don't always hear about is that most of those deaths are preventable. We have really good treatments for opioid and alcohol especially, but even for methamphetamines and other drugs, we've got new treatments for those as well. The problem is not that addictions are untreatable. The problem is that we do not have enough addiction trained doctors, nurses, and other professionals giving evidence-based medicine. 
So people are dying from lack of access to life-saving treatments. So funding this addiction fellowship guarantees that we will continue to be training addiction specialists who can work to address this incredible public health problem and to improve access to addiction care around the state. Okay, so specialty trained addiction doctors do many things. Of course, they take care of patients with addictions. So for example, I myself take care of more than 800 people addicted to fentanyl and opioid, uh, opioids, plus I treat people with alcoholism and methamphetamine addiction and the rest. But addiction doctors do more than that. So for example, my colleague Brian Grand, Dr. Brian Grand, also a graduate from the program, he runs a telemedicine conference called ECHO that supports general practitioners around the state so that they can give addiction treatment. Dr. Graham's ECHO series has trained more than 1,400 physicians, pharmacists, and nurses from 46 different counties with hundreds of hours of teaching and training. So the fellowship doesn't just train doctors, it trains trainers. Uh, and that's a really important part of it. And especially getting that reach to the rural counties and some underserved counties in the metro is critical. Um, just a few more examples. There's a, a former fellow, Dr. Matson, who's worked at a Native American reservation. Dr. Puringer work up, works up in Duluth with Essentia. Dr. Schultz and Hubble are teaching medical st students at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis and Duluth. Dr. Pilkis has been on the Opioid Epidem Epidemic Response Advisory Committee. So we have this, and that's just naming a few of our fellows that have done incredible work for the state. Um, we also, I'm very excited next year, we have an incredible diverse group of fellows coming in. So I'm very excited for the future. Uh, and addiction fellows, uh, as an aside, have, have largely stayed in Minnesota. So m the vast majority of our fellow graduates have stayed in the state and served the people of our state. Now it seems to me that the cost of the bill is minimal compared to the cost savings of preventing all the illness and death that these doctors will accomplish. So for example, this young man I saw in the ICU this morning, that hospital bill alone is tens of thousands of dollars, just for one person. Um, bringing stable funding to the Addiction Fellowship sends a signal throughout the state that Minnesota will improve access for all people to get addiction treatment and will also train the future leaders and future teachers that we need to combat the drug epidemic for our state. So I'm asking to please vote to secure ongoing funding for the Addiction Fellowship for Minnesota and thank you very much for considering the bill. And obviously, I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Reznikov, for your testimony and for your work. Uh, our next testifier, uh, Dr. Specker, if you could please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Dr. Sheila Specker at the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me also to testify on Senate File 1269. My name is Dr. Sheila Specker, and I'm a family physician and addiction psychiatrist at the University of Minnesota and the program director of the Minnesota Addiction Medicine Fellowship, which is shared between Hennepin County Medical Center, the University of Minnesota, and the VA Medical Center. I also want to thank Senator Fate for authoring legislation for the only addiction medicine fellowship in the state. I'm also a graduate of our fellowship in the earlier days. As we know, there are million, 21 million Americans that have an addiction with only under 2,000 physicians being specially trained to treat them. The lack of trained specialists is why only one in 10 people with a substance use disorder receive treatment. In Minnesota, there have been only probably between 30 and 40% of the counties that had no physicians who had federal approval to prescribe the highly effective and life-saving medication of buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. Even with lifting this year of the requirement to obtain a special waiver to prescribe this medication, physicians still are not trained to use it. In my experience, my physician colleagues are just not comfortable prescribing it even in my own department. Um, I am also the only addiction psychiatrist in our department at the University of Minnesota and one of two addiction physicians. So we have quite a ways to go. The fellowship trains, out, trains physicians to be able to train others, as Dr. Reznikoff said. That's one of, our, um, one of our core tenets, I would say. We're all acutely aware of the skyrocketing overdose deaths from synthetic opioids, in particular fentanyl. 
Also, the pandemic has triggered an increase in alcohol use and alcohol problems, especially in women, and methamphetamine use has also greatly increased. The Addiction Medicine Fellowship is a 12-month subspecialty program which began in 1982 and trains physicians of all specialties to become experts in the prevention, clinical evaluation, treatment, and ongoing care of persons with addiction. Fellows are trained to treat patients throughout the lifespan from prenatal to adolescence and through adulthood using evidence-based therapies. These are medication-assisted therapies in and outpatient treatments, therapies for co-occurring psychiatric problems. The program also trains physicians to be leaders and educators of other physicians. Training takes place not just in the metro area, but also outstate, and Owatonna is one site. Nearly all of our graduates have or are practicing in Minnesota, as you've heard, some in academic settings, such as Hennepin, the university, or the VA, and others in rural, community, and underserved areas. For example, a recent fellow that just completed our fellowship is up in northern Minnesota in Duluth. And our current fellow is African-American woman who will be working in one of our local hospitals, which has a large population of underserved persons. The program has received formal accreditation by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. We've recently received a temporary uh, approval to increase the number of positions because of the great need to expand the workforce and with funding we will be able to apply for a permanent increase. Each year the program struggles to cover fellowship stipends due to lack of sustainability, sustainable funding. We receive partial funding from our partners. The residency programs receive GME funding that's funded through federal dollars but that does not include fellowships. This coming academic year, we will have the most fellows we've ever had, and that's four, who come from backgrounds of internal medicine and family medicine. And I think this demonstrates the passion and commitment to the field of medicine, to this field of medicine. So we continue to look for sustainable function, funding. The proposal would allow us to train up to three physicians for two years, and per year, the cost would be 240000 We appreciate past support from the legislature and hope the legislature will invest in our program because we truly are a statewide resource that expands the workforce of physicians trained in addiction and hence can reach populations that are most in need of addiction care. Thank you again for the committee's time, and we can answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Specker. Members, any questions for our testifiers or commentary on the bill? Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Senator Fate, for bringing this bill forward. And thanks to our testifiers for coming here and providing some very uh, critical testimony, especially as it relates to the, the problem of addiction that we sometimes have to deal with, not just in the state of Minnesota, but in the country. My uh, grandfather, who has since passed, he ran a place, he, he founded and ran a place called New Life Outpatient Center. Uh, he had a big heart, and he specifically tried to help people that struggled with addiction. And I can only hope that um, as we are looking at and crafting other legislation here in the state of Minnesota, that we are paying very close attention to the problem of addiction, and we're listening to folks like yourselves who are experts in the field, who live it every day and have to deal with it and see its impacts on folks. So um, as we're here to craft responsible and good legislation, and we've got other bills moving that have to do with the legalizing of marijuana or cannabis, I'm very, very hopeful that we are seeking expertise, uh, like the expertise you have provided today, to ensure that whatever we do pass is done responsibly. So thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you uh, to Senator Fate and to the testifiers. Um, I am familiar with or well aware of uh, the disparity between providers and the problem people, uh, the number of people that are dealing with substance abuse, substance, it's one of those days, substance abuse disorder. So I am inquiring about the decision in the bill um, to fund three fellows, how we reach that number, what that means for capacity uh, for you, Senator Fate, or for your testifiers. Dr. Speck. Okay. Mr. Chair and Senator, 
Um, I think through the years, we have had typically two to three um, fellows. And as we're looking to expand, so this coming year is four. And I'm hopeful going forward. I think the amount came because it, typically it's two to three that we train. Senator Murphy. Um, thank you, um, Senator Putnam, um, Chair Putnam. And so uh, the request is aligning with the experience that you're having and not necessarily trying to meet um, the demand or the future demand. Hmm. And I understand that you, know, you just can't plug and play providers into programs, but I'm just um, trying to understand what is guiding those numbers. Dr. Specker, would you like further comment? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator. Um, yes, we are basing it on our current financial situation with the other institutions. So of the funds that we have coming in that we can count on, and then the funds that we would be short um, so, like I had mentioned, that we do receive funds from partners, but it doesn't cover entirely the, um, the stipends of the fellows. And the department has to also support our time and our effort um, in addition to the stipends for the fellows. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any further uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, Senator Fate, do you have any final comments? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I just want to thank the testifiers for coming out uh, today for this important bill. And like they mentioned, um, these deaths are pre preventable. Overdose deaths are preventable. And we need to do what we can to get more um, folks that are able to uh, practice this form of specialized medicine so, or specialized care. So um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the committee. Chair Fate, would you like to move your bill? Yes, I would like to move the bill to be uh, laid over. Chair Fate moves that Senate file 1269 be laid over for yeah. possible inclusion, yeah. and the bill is laid over. Thank you. Next, we have Senate File 1295, Senator Rarick. Uh, welcome. I understand you have an A1 um, amendment that you'd like to move. Uh, would you like to tell us more about the amendment and make a motion? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yes, I guess I would uh, move uh, Senate File 1295, and then I'd like to move the A1 author's amendment to that as well. Thank you, thank you, Senator Rare. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed. The amendment is adopted. Please continue, Senator Rare. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I want to thank Ms. Oliver. Um, the amendment that, uh, if members do have some questions on the amendment, uh, it is my understanding that uh, um, the bill that we'll talk about a little bit that we passed uh, before uh, in regards to this. Uh, some of the funding was based on federal dollars that were coming in, which uh, the potential or we know there are going to be fewer dollars coming from the federal government. So this, um, the state is stepping up to make up that difference uh, from our past, what we passed in uh, two years ago. So maybe Ms. Oliver has more she can fill in on that. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Chair. Members, for the record, my name is Nikki Oliver. I'm the Director of Grants and Government Relations for the Office of Higher Education. And actually, Senator Rick did a great job of summarizing the situation. <laughs> so um, we're here in the audience just in case there's more questions. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions from committee members? Okay. 
Senator Eric, would you like to present the bill? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll, so to the, the, the new part of the bill uh, for this year, um, you know, I want, again, begin um, by thanking Mr. Huang. Um, in 2021, uh, he came to me with the bill um, that we passed then looking to increase uh, some funding for those in foster care uh, to, for their tuition assistance. Um, this is a, a group of kids that uh, they don't have the typical supports that other kids have. You know, I, I think back to, you know, my son uh, was the first, um, or I had not gone to college. Um, he was uh, going to college. I didn't have a lot of experience in helping him, but I was there and I would assist him. He had a place to come home on weekends if he wanted. Um, a lot of these foster kids do not have that same support. And so one of the, with that legislation, we provided tuition assistance to make sure that they could get, um, whether it was two-year school, four-year school, um, covered so that they could focus on some of the other um, issues that they didn't have that assistance for. This bill is going one more step and is going to give them some of that assistance and um, supports to get through the process, to understand what's there, and to have someone that they can have conversations with, have discussions with, to help guide them along the path and give them that support. And, and you know, this is, a, I'm honored to be able to carry it, but uh, the testifiers we have can exp and talk about it way better than I can. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to um, hand it over to the testifiers. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Huang Murphy, and it's an honor to be testifying before you today. So I'm the founder and ED of a nonprofit called Foster Advocates, and we work with people who have experienced foster care to create policy change. And you know, I just gotta say, it's always really surreal to be in places like this, because it could have so easily not been possible. Uh, I entered foster care when I was eight years old, and I entered because I was enrolled in school for the very first time. I was just so excited to be there. I felt so lucky. They even give you lunch. And I think immediately teachers recognized I was a kid that was in danger. And I got lucky. The system worked exactly as it was designed to. I entered foster care three days later. I was just told I had to make sure my, my little brother got on the bus with me. And I did. I went on to graduate from high school and it was the first time I found me to go to college. It's why I became a teacher so that I could see kids, just like that, that teacher, who unfortunately will remain nameless in my life, so I could see them as well. And for me, education was the path out. And I think for so many of our young people who are in state custody, who have experienced foster care, this is the only path out. We just know that if you do not have the support circles that college provides, the connections, that the community of education professionals can provide for you and the credentialing provided by a trade school or a four-year program, your chances of making it through are going to be very difficult. And we know what systems our young people end up in if they don't have those things available to them. However, I wanna apologize just a little bit because I deeply wish I could paint a really positive picture about where fosters are ending up and where fosters are landing, but I can't because upon reaching their 21st birthday, most of my peers should be celebrating, but fosters face a deep stability cliff. They are cut off from resources and support the moment they turn 21. It's a heck of a birthday gift that we provide our young people, but by providing these supports for them to pursue education, we allow them a pathway beyond this cliff and a bridge to a better future. And so what I would love to do is speak to some of the benefits of the FIG program, which I'm so excited that Senator Eric led uh, so many years ago that it's finally in place. And so there are 389 young people across the state have taken advantage of this program. Uh, I won't get into too much of the nitty gritty details, but at the U of M campuses, there are 19 young people. Uh, at the private colleges and universities, there's 49. And then at our two year trade and technical schools, there's 228 young people pursuing their college dreams. And at M state programs, there's 68. 
So that's about 389 total, uh, if I can count accurately, but please double check my math. That's what Ohi here, he is here for. Uh, but really, we're just seeing young people be able to dream, right? Every other kid is told that they can just think about things that are happening in their future and go fight for it. But fosters are told that they have to be tough. They have to have grit. But now we can say at 13 years old that you can hope for a better future. You can start dreaming about what the world could look like. You can care about high school. You can care about your life after that. And I'm really excited for that. So I'm going to pass it back to Senator Rarick um, and allow other folks to testify, but I'm available for any t questions that you might have about the program or about our work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, Senator Rarick, or should we pass to the we'll next just, uh, keep testimony. on going with testifiers. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, first up on our list, we have uh, Travis Matthews. So please introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. My name is Travis Matthews. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Travis Matthews, and you don't know me, but you probably already know what my future holds. When I age out of foster care, my chances of becoming homeless, incarcerated, or struggling with addiction were far more likely than of graduating from college. Only 3% of fosters will, degree, will get a degree by the time they're 25. Like many fosters, my childhood was traumatic, I was separated from my family right before the age of 13, and therefore I bounced from placement to placement, creating instability in my life. I felt like my life had ended the day I went into the system. My life felt destined towards failure because of a lack of family and financial support and little from the state in those areas. It should be considered tragic, but unfortunately it's considered common. It's happening to all of us. The topic of college isn't on many fosters' minds, but it was on mine. I remember all the seniors were so happy that they were graduating and going to college to get degrees and make their dreams come true. I wanted to feel that way. I wanted what they had, people who believed in them and in turn a belief in themselves. I applied myself in school and fought to take PSEO classes at Itasca Community College. I rebuilt myself as more than just the foster kid. I decided I was going to go to college, be successful and defy the odds. I, live in, I lived in Grand Rapids, Minnesota in a group home until I began my undergraduate studies at Hamlin University. I'm currently pursuing a degree in legal studies and social justice, and I'm extremely active within my university. I'm part of the Student Congress at Hamlin, and I'm currently running for student body president. Sometimes it feels like a dream. As I began college, I soon realized how behind I was on financial literacy and basic knowledge that many of my peers, parents, and families had already taught them. Increasing anxiety about obtaining funds for college and life after high school seemed to creep up on me. Many of my classmates had a place to go home if they failed out of college, or a parent they could ask to co-sign loans for, or ask for any financial support. This safety net was non-existent for me. Having a community that I could relate to was a huge factor in feeling that I belonged in higher education. I was connected with foster advocates during my senior year of high school, actually. I was provided a community where my experiences, voice, and identity were supported and embraced for the first time in my life. They provided me not only community support, but the essential financial, emotional, and life-saving support that no one else could. The Fostering Higher Education Act has paved a path for many fosters, including myself, but it's just the beginning. The foster success appropriation will fill a significant gap in our state. It will provide a holistic support system to further educational opportunities for so many fosters who truly need it. My voice is just one voice in a course of fosters across the state who can benefit from your commitment to SF-1295. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Matthews, for your powerful testimony. Thank you. Um, next on our list, we have um, Marcellus, and I, I apologize if I mispronounce the last name, Efon Laja, uh, who's a community board co-chair for Foster Advocates. So please proceed. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it is a privilege to speak before you today. Uh, my name is Marcellus Efon Laja, and I go by Selly. I'm currently a full-time finance student at Metro State, a full-time deal services intern with Clifton Larson Allen, a board member of Students United, and I'm most proud of being a co-chair of our community board at Foster Advocates. I'm here today to share my own education journey and speak to the need for statewide expansion of the Foster Success Program. I often think about the support that I needed, but never really could find. 
And while I thank God every day for the people who have joined and left my corner, much of my journey has progressed along a tightrope with no safety net to fall on. I was committed to college from a young age. By sixth grade, I knew it was my mission to attain a degree and provide a better living situation for my family. I had experienced foster care multiple times growing up, and in the ninth grade, my mother could no longer take care of me. Uh, despite my living and family situation, it was time to start planning for college. I was blessed by the support I received from my teachers and the college readiness programs at the time, but they just weren't aware of my unique needs as a foster. And to be honest, at that age, neither was I. So I took it upon myself to do some research, and eventually I was accepted into a fly-in program at the Farmer School of Business at Miami University. I was granted a scholarship upon applying early decision. Because of this, I was committed to attending the college. Um, the award letter I received did not cover the full bill, and yet I felt obligated to continue my mission. Uh, for me, not attempting to go to college imposed the same consequences as going to college and it not working out. Um, and it didn't quite work out because I could barely afford to leave school during Thanksgiving break, and by the end of the first semester, all the financial resources I could muster were not enough for me to cover the tuition that I now owe the institution. Um, I felt the depth of these consequences upon returning back to Minnesota because I had no home to come back to. I spent about a year and a half couch hopping while working two full-time jobs to secure a living and pay down the debt so I could take another shot at college. During that time, I was extremely afraid. I was afraid that I crushed my potential and I was watching it crumble out of my own hands. Thankfully, God had a plan when I did not. And before I knew it, I was back at St. Paul College reclaiming myself. I immediately decided to study accounting because after that experience, I realized that maybe I needed to track my money a little better. And soon, uh, despite being homeless just two years prior, I was elected to lead my peers as the student body president. I share my story because once I found my footing in college, it changed my life. It also allowed me to take it back. And I want that for not just fosters, but all students. Um, I want to express my gratitude for the work done on the Fostering Higher Education Act. This bill is really turning the tides and has already begun changing hundreds of lives. Um, and really, it can't end there. The team at Foster Advocates has brilliant minds and strong, genuine hearts. I'm extremely confident that with the Foster Success Program, our team will continue to create capacity to expand across the state, reaching fosters early on so that they can materialize their dreams before they begin to give up on them. So thank you for your time today, and please support Fosters by supporting SF 1295. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Afanlaja, for sharing your experience. Um, finally, on our list, we have uh, Ariana Guerra, who is the Director of Systems Change. Um, so please proceed with your testimony. Okay. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the chance to speak before you today. My name is Ariana Guerra, and I am the Director of Systems Change at Foster Advocates. As this committee understands more than most, there are many students in our state with significant needs. Each and every one of them deserves access to a quality education. However, we often forget about the most overlooked student population, and that is fosters. In 2021, 83% of Minnesota's general population students graduated from high school in the traditional four-year track. Meanwhile, only 37% of their foster peers were able to achieve the same success. Fosters rank lower than all other demographic breakdowns in our state, including young people experiencing homelessness. They are statistically less likely to graduate high school than all of their peers. There are many fat fosters who wish to graduate high school and even more who wish to pursue higher education. But in our work with fosters, we know there are significant barriers that prevent them from doing so. In fact, studies have found that only 3% of fosters will successfully obtain a four-year college degree. It is yet another unfortunate statistic. The Fostering Higher Education Act has eliminated the financial barrier, yes. However, we know the financial component was never the immediate barrier that fosters faced. In reality, it's exactly these barriers that Sally and Travis shared with us today. It's housing instability, food insecurity, mental health, limited financial support, and so much more. We are here today not only to highlight the significant gap, but we're committed to providing the solution. 
With this appropriation, we would begin to remedy the issue by expanding our model statewide, providing individualized coaching, housing navigation, college support, and other wraparound services to all fosters by fosters. And as Sally said so well, it wasn't that these programs didn't want to help him, it was that they didn't know how. And as Travis said so well, there was no safety net to catch them. As a foster myself, I was lucky. I had that safety net. Despite everything else, I had access to a great education in Albert Lee, Minnesota. Uh, my foster parents, my social worker, teachers, and friends were diligent when it came to getting me through high school, probably more than most. And I am beyond thankful for them. The reality, though, is that most fosters do not have this person in their lives. But this program allows us to be. We are grateful for the Fostering Higher Education Act and the equity it has provided for our community. We are also grateful for the collaboration between our organization and the Office of Higher Education. Special shout out to Adam Johnson, Nikki Oliver, and Megan Flores. Together we work to get this off the ground and get fosters onto their own education pathways. It truly is a great example of how a state agency and community partner can and should work together. Our foster success program that is in front of us today is valuable, and the time to provide these interventions is now. With your support, SF1295 will ensure that fosters have the best possible chance to succeed, and they deserve it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Ms. Guerra, for sharing your story. Um, are there any questions from committee members? Comments, discussion? S Senator Kupek. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I want to thank Senator Rarick for bringing this bill forward. This is really good. We had a, Mr. Murphy and I, Ms. Queer, we had a great conversation in my office. Uh, I think this is a, a great way to, to open up that opportunity for higher education for all Minnesotans, and especially you know, in a population that it oftentimes is underserved by the state. So, so I just want to say thank you for bringing this forward. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just want to speak in support of this. Um, most people wouldn't know that my dad actually grew up in foster care um, on the East Coast. I've never met my biological family on that side. He was in college for about two weeks before he decided that it wasn't for him. Uh, fortunately, the military was an option. He joined the Air Force, and so he sort of had that fallback. Um, but I recognize that a lot of people don't necessarily have that, and so I think this is a good program. Um, that I can personally get behind that can help, you know, people like my dad that uh, probably needed, well, not probably, that definitely needed a little bit more help uh, in life than somebody like myself or Senator Rarick's son um, have received. Thank you. Senator Umu Verbatim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know that OHI continues, continues to remind us of our statewide attainment goal and um, I think Ms. Guerra just outlined really perfectly that the, these are um, students that are forgotten and um, they need that support so that they can make it to college and succeed. And I just want to thank um, our um, students and former students for sharing their stories and just share how proud we are of all of you. Any other discussion, comments? I want to say thank you all for sharing your stories and coming out, and Senator Rarick for um, leading on this. Um, what struck me was that with this support and the safety net you're providing, it's not only helping the students, but we're watching them grow into leaders. We've, we've heard two of them speak about the leadership roles that they've ran for and gotten, so um, proud of you all. Um, Senator Rarick, would you like to move your bill? Uh, thank you. Um, just, Mr. Chair, close real quick. You yes. know, um, many of us um, have groups come forward with bills that you're asked to carry and, and you agree. Um, you know, this one, um, as I would, was getting information and working with Mr. Murphy and hearing the stories, it suddenly became clear this wasn't, you know, just a, a bill I was carrying. This was uh, very important. It was really going to have an impact on, on kids who needed that support. And this, uh, Senate file 1295 is extending that help that we uh, offered in 2021. That mentorship um, that 
many of us take for granted. Just having that person to speak to um, can make such a difference, whether it's just to bounce an idea off them, to get some advice. Um, this will go a long way to giving fosters that assistance that many of us take for granted that they don't have access to typically. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for hearing the bill. And I would like to renew my motion uh, that Senate file 1295 be uh, laid over for con possible consideration. Uh, Senator Rarick moves that Senate file 1295 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion. And the bill as amended is laid over. With no further business, uh, the committee is now adjourned. <laughs>